Welcome. I'd like to welcome everyone for coming uh, to the third of the webinar series we like to call HECA Electrophysiological Update. Uh, I'd like to thank all of you for attending. I know for some of you it's either very early in the morning or very late at night, and we really do appreciate that you could attend. Our webinar today, uh, so our agenda for our webinar today is First, we'll discuss a little bit about a product update to our EPC-800 and our Patchmaster software. Then we'll go into our presentations. First presenter will be Jan Dolzer, and his talk will be Prelude, Setting the Stage for Sodium Currents, followed by Hubert Alfolter, whose presentation is Getting to Know the Protagonist, Classic Characterization of a Sodium Current, and finally, my talk on recording under the influence of pharmacology of a sodium current. Uh, we will end the webinar with a question and answer session. Uh, hopefully you are hearing my introduction now. Uh, audio should be transmitted over your IP connection. If you do have a problem with hearing me, please go to your telephone and dial one of these access numbers and use this access code to, to get uh, connected. As I mentioned, at the end of the session, we'll be having a Q&A session, and we'd like for you to use the Q&A section in your session control panel to type in your questions. Please also indicate which speaker your question is directed to, and we will try our best to address all the questions in this session if time allows. If not, we will respond to them through offline via email. After the webinar, we will be directed to a short survey that we hope you fill out. Uh, this survey is quite important for us. We would like to get your feedback on, the, on actually on the webinar for today, how to improve it, uh, what your scientific applications are. We would like to understand what your needs are and what experimental procedures you are performing. And more importantly, we would also like your opinions on which direction you think our future development should take, both in hardware and in software. You will also have the opportunity to fill out a form for us to get in touch with you regarding any need that you may have. Uh, we would also like if you would suggest uh, topics for future webinars and user meetings. Your time is valuable and we did our best to try to keep this survey as short as possible. All our slides, decks, and PDF versions of this presentation uh, is available already from download from our event page. So if you go to our website, www.heca.com, and you go to events, and then user meetings and webinars, all the recordings, slide decks, PDFs, and so forth of this webinar, and all our previous user meetings and webinars are available. This webinar will be recorded, and probably within a week or so, we will have the recording available online. Uh, everybody who registered for this uh, webinar will get an email notification once it's available. HECA likes to do a few user meetings, uh, typically at the Biophysical Society meeting and at the Society for Neuroscience meeting. Uh, our last meeting was at the Biophysical Society meeting in San Francisco. Uh, if you attend it, then this webinar is basically a, uh, a repeat with some minor adjustments from that meeting. Those presentations, as well as past events, are available as our web in our website, as I mentioned earlier. And then be sure uh, to join us in our next meeting, which will be at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in Washington, D.C. Uh, information for that meeting is currently not available, but it will be available shortly, and we will update our website and send an email notification before the event as well. If you have not already done so, please sign up for notification emails uh, and by sending a short message to events at HECA.com. So now I'd like to discuss a little bit about the product updates. First, um, the EPC-800, our dual-mode patch clamp amplifier, had a firmware update that we released uh, sometime in April um, this year. Uh, there should have already been a notification to everyone on that, but just in case. 
Uh, we have made improvements to uh, the automatic C fast, C slow, and VP offset in regards to the algorithms. Uh, and also, since we have auto functions with manual touch up, we have made improvements on that as well. Uh, the seal sound is a feature that's built into the EPC 800, and we have enabled that with this firmware release. We have improved the reliability and speed of the USB connection. Uh, we have added more messages both to the LCD display and to beep on error. And we've improved consistency between remote mode and physical settings of knobs and buttons. And there's a few other minor um, tweaks and adjustments that we have made. How do you receive this update? Well, the update is free of charge for the EPC 800 customers. Uh, it's user installable. There are a few early versions of the EPC 100 that do require uh, hardware modifications. Those units can be sent in to HECA to be upgraded. Uh, we will cover all of the shipping charges, both back and forth. Please contact us for information. You could contact us by email, support at HECA.com. Or you could contact one of our offices directly. We have offices in Germany, in Canada, and the USA. Please contact the one closest to you. About a month ago, we also released Patchmaster version 2.73.1. This is a maintenance release. It has no new features. In our download page, we have a done list which shows all of the information regarding what changes with each uh, release version, what has been done. You could download that as well. Uh, HECA usually tries to have two to three releases per year, uh, which would include one major feature release and one to two main releases. And this is typically on our Patchmaster and Potmaster software packages. These updates are available free of charge, for, and they can be downloaded from the HECA download page. The HECA download page also includes information uh, regarding manuals, downloads, brochures, and some additional tools that can be downloaded as well. With that, I'd like to introduce our presenters today in reverse order of how they're actually going to be presenting. So I will be last. So I introduce myself first. So my name is Telly Gagliatatos, and I graduated from Queens College with a degree in computer science. In 1987, I went to work for Instratech Corporation. Over the 20 years that I was with Instratech, I had a variety of different roles. In 2007, uh, Instratech uh, shut down, and HECA uh, bought over the assets of that company, and I joined HECA and became the general manager for their New York office. Our second speaker, Hubert Alfolter, uh, graduated at the Institute of Technology from Zurich, Switzerland in 1980. Uh, his study was in ion-sensitive electrodes. From 1980 to 1983, he was a postdoc at the University Hospital in Basel, Switzerland. In 1984 to 86, he was the State University of North Carolina, also as a postdoc. From 1986 to 88, he joined Yale University Medical School as an associate research scientist. In 1989, 1991, he joined Institute Corporation of Software Engineer. And since 1991, Hubert has been HECA senior software architect. Our first speaker, Jan Dolzer, graduated from Marburg, Germany in 2002. His uh, specialty was electrophysiology with insect sensilla. He joined Axon Instruments slash Molecular Devices, various versions of it, from 2003 to 2011. Uh, in 2011, he joined Sutter Instrument as a product manager for their laser-based micropipette pullers. In 2012, he joined HEC Electronics. He was vice president of sales and marketing. And currently, he's returned to Sutter Instruments as their product development and technical support specialist. With that, I would like to pass on uh, the screen to Jan for his presentation, uh, setting the stage for sodium currents. Thank you very much, Telly. 
I will set the stage for not only sodium currents but for the other two speakers in this uh, webinar and I'll keep it fairly short so I will uh, introduce a number of parameters that are interested when you do patch clamp recordings from sodium channels and uh, the agenda of my talk is a brief, very brief introduction into sodium channels then I'll uh, talk about a classic biophysical characterization of, a so of sodium currents, what do people t typically look at, and then Hubert will talk about a number of these parameters that I introduce in the interest of time. We will not be able to talk about all of them. And then I will go into pharmacology experiments and that will refer uh, reference what Telly will talk about at the end uh, when he records under the influence. Voltage-gated sodium ch uh, channels have a fairly uh, conservative, uh, high, highly conserved structure. Alpha subunits have four transmembrane domains uh, with uh, six alpha helices each. And I'll we'll go over this in the interest of the um, fu more functional aspects of the talk uh, fairly quickly. We uh, know about NAF 1.1 to 1.9 and then the somewhat oddball RNAx. If you look at a single channel recording from a voltage gated sodium channel and um, look at the single channel responses to a depolarizing voltage step shown up above here and then you look at either the average or in this uh, second example the, sum, the summed responses of these individual channels then you see something that looks very similar to a whole cell recording. So you have, in a sense, the statistics already built in if you do a whole cell recording, and that's why most people today record in whole cell mode, actually. And that's what's shown here. Sodium currents in response to a depolarizing voltage step from a holding potential of minus 100 millivolts to a depolarizing minus 40 millivolts. We have a fast couple of millisecond duration inward current and that can be influenced by phototoxin, the toxin derived from the puffer fish, fugu, that's very popular in sushi restaurants but pretty expensive too. Um, and then um, in a dose dependent manner the sodium currents are blocked by the phototoxin. That's something that most of us learned in the early days of uh, studying biology. So where are sodium channels important? I will only mention two uh, examples here. One are neuronal action potentials and the sodium currents shape the depolarizing the initial phase of the action potential. And the same goes for the cardiac action potential where both in man, mouse and most other species NAV 1.5 mostly uh, is responsible for the sharp rising initial depolarizing phase of the action potential. But then there's a number of other channels that play a role and shape this long plateau phase in the human cardiac action potential and mouse is slightly different and uh, other species are too. So much for the introduction. Let me talk about the classic characterization of sodium voltage gated sodium uh, currents. If you show a picture like this to any patch clamp or anybody who has done patch clamp or heard about it, they will instantly say, well, this is a voltage gated sodium current. Um, again, we have those inward peaks, a couple of milliseconds in duration, and this is the typical signature of a sodium current, a family of currents in response to a variety of depolarizing voltage steps and if you measure the peak inward currents at each of these voltages and then plot that versus the test voltage, so the step voltage here, you get this IV relation, the current voltage relation. This is averaged with the actual current values, current amplitudes of the, the inward peaks. If you normalize that to the a maximum peak, then one of the parameters you're typically interested in is the peak voltage, the voltage at which you get the highest 
inward current um, uh, over the voltage range and for most sodium channels that's typically in the in the range 0 to minus 20 millivolts. From the IV relation you can also derive the reversal potential or apparent reversal potential because most sodium currents don't reverse depending on the conditions. Uh, and that's typically somewhere near the sodium reversal potential obviously uh, at plus 70 plus 80 millivolts thereabouts. And with this you can compute the GV curve, the conductance voltage relationship. And one of the values that you want to derive from this is the half activation potential, the potential at which half the maximal current is elicited by these depolarizing voltage steps. Another parameter that's interesting is the steady state inactivation. So by a series of um, inactivating voltage steps that are followed by a depolarizing test potential then, you measure the peak inward currents again and plot them versus the potential of the um, of the inactivate, uh, inactivating voltage step. What you see is the further you depolarize your cell before the actual test pulse, the, uh, the less sodium current you can elicit. So sodium channels inactivate. And again the parameter that people are typically interested in is the half inactivation potential, V one half. And what you do with that, usually um, this type of plot where you have the, the, half inact uh, the, the inactivation and the, uh, the activation curve and the activation and inactivation potentials, this is a signature of a particular preparation or a particular condition that you record your, uh, your channels in. So you uh, look at the conductance relationship and what you get is the uh, M infinity or half uh, activation potential and the steady state inactivation, the H infinity, the half inactivation potential and those you need for uh, the Hodgkin-Huxley model uh, at the end of the day. So this is one characteristic, one set of parameters that people um, analyze when they look at sodium currents, voltage-gated sodium currents. Another as aspect is recovery, uh, recovery from inactivation. So what we see here is an inactivating voltage step, in this case from minus 100 to minus 20 millivolts, and then um, test pulses at various intervals after uh, the, the inactivation step. And the longer the intervals get, the more of the current recovers, the more of the current is there. And in this paper, Cummins et al., um, what was compared were two different cell types. NAF 1.3 expressed in, I believe it was X cells and uh, DRG neurons, associated, freshly associated DRG uh, neurons. In this case, the recovery duration of the two conditions, two cell types, uh, was almost identical. But when the authors did not return to the holding potential uh, at minus 100, but to a slightly depolarized level after the um, inactivating step, uh, they saw and, and uh, did this for different recovery um, time periods. They saw that there was a difference in fact and this followed uh, this um, recovery duration that depends on the re recovery du duration followed an exponential function and looking at the time constant of that uh, exponential function, uh, they would see that in fact at minus 100 there's virtually no difference between the two cell types, but at minus 70 as I showed you before, there's a substantial difference in the recovery time constant. One more parameter that people like to look at, uh, at is the time of the peak of the inward current. So after the the polarizing step, which isn't shown here, which is at, at uh, t equals zero. And measuring that time for all depolarizing steps, you would look at the uh, kinetics here 
and again in this case um, there's it's, uh, it's it's two different preparations that are compared cardiac and neuronal uh, cells another parameter is the time constant of the decay or the inactivation after the peak of the sodium invert currents again this is a an exponential can can be described by an exponential function and looking at the time constant again the tau here um, you could see that there's a difference between these two cell types or whatever conditions you want to compare so this is a set of uh, parameters for the classical uh, characterization Hubert is uh, going to show a few of these not all of them let's switch gears to the pharmacology experiments a lot of times what people want to do is find out how does a certain drug uh, affect my preparation, my currents. In this case, what was applied is, uh, I think it was titrodotoxin, I meant to look that up. Um, and in a dose-dependent manner, the compound that was applied here blocks the sodium inward currents. Here are individual sweeps, and here's the time course. And what Telly will show you later on is for uh, a set, um, for a data set that Ted Cummins um, gave us for the purposes of this talk. Um, he will look at the time course under control conditions and then um, different concentrations of the compound. He will compute the steady state current from the last n data points in this time course and then create a dose response curve out of that. Another example, um, if you average results from multiple cells, one parameter that you, you're typically interested in is the IC50, the concentration at which 50% of the peak current has been blocked. And for TTX, in this example, um, it would be around 20 nanomolar. And at uh, different holding potentials, if you hold at the half inactivation potential, you would get a different IC50 compared to holding at a uh, hyperpolarized potential of minus 120 millivolt in, in this example. And that is for different blockers here, tetracaine, lidocaine, amitriptyline, and mexilidine. One more aspect to look at is the use-dependent block of, of sodium currents. That's shown here, use dependence in the control condition in a succession of depolarizing pulses. The amplitude remains largely constant, but then in the, con in the presence of a blocker, you have more or less dose dependence. So in this case, the last the response to the last pulse is slightly diminished. Here it's it's much more diminished. And here again this is uh, comparing the two different blockers where uh, the ratio between these two is compared to the ratio between these two responses to the first and the last pulse. With that let me thank Ted Cummins, now at the University of Indiana in Indianapolis, for providing us with data that Telly will use uh, in his talk to show the dose response curves. And Nanion provided a, a few more data sets that help us with that. Uh, sorry, Ted, uh, Ted's data are not only used in, in uh, Telly's talk, they're, they're used in uh, Hubert's talk. Thank you very much, and with that, back to Telly. Thank you very much, Jan. Okay, so now we'll set, switch our presenter to Hubert. And okay, Hubert. Okay. My talk will concentrate on the classical characterization of sodium currents using Patchmaster. <clears throat> the goal here for the next quarter of an hour is to give 
a rather short introduction in what we can achieve. So the goal will be to show how to characterize sodium currents in Patchmaster. I will use figures and data published in articles to outline this task. So the data come from outside, which means you can reproduce using with Patchmaster even when people have done an experiment using completely their own approach. I will guide you how to set up this experiment. I usually suggest you start with the relationship you want to look at, then you think about the required analysis you want to apply in Patchmaster. And the next step is then to build up the pattern, the stimulus pattern, which is supposed to evoke the required cellular current. In this talk, I will, time providing, also mention and describe additional features which Patchmaster offers to compensate for leak and artifact subtraction. So the original figures I'm using in this presentation come from uh, Ted Kuming. He also provided us some data so I can show you how it looks, you, um, the experiments and the analysis using his data. And all the information I used for extracting what he applied and how to analyze the data are coming directly from the original data files themselves. So just a short note, um, you will see the patch master can read data files of older versions and automatically upgrade them to the newest version. And the second, the most important part is that all these data for contain the information which extensively describe the experiments, so allows you to reconstruct what has been done and what the conditions of the experiments were. Typically, like in, the, in Jan's talk, the first thing which people are looking in a publication, <clears throat> in this case in figure 1a, is a family of recordings. And out of this family of recordings, by measuring the peak current of every recording, plotting it as fraction of the current against the voltage of the challenging segment, you, you get this typical current voltage relation. This is from figure 1c from the mentioned publication. The second thing I address is the inactivation. And inactivation is performed by steady state inactivation giving a function, uh, giving a voltage and measuring the response. Okay. The third analysis I'm going to provide is the recovery from inactivation from figure 4C out of the mentioned publication. Okay, let's start with this current voltage relation. In this figure, we are trying to extract what we, how we have to approach to reproduce this experiment. So, on the x-axis we see the voltage and its increasing voltage of the test amplitude. On the y-axis we see the fraction of peak current, that means the measured peak current divided by the maximum peak current of this experiment. So what steps are involved? We have to apply a series of test pulses with increasing voltage steps. Then we measure the peak current, we determine the maximum peak current, we normalize the peak current and then we plot it in a plot like that. So the stimulus pattern is defined in the consequence of the requirement 
of the predicted relationship. So this is the pulse generator, the central place where you would define a stimulus in Patchmaster. I will focus on the following subsections. Down on the left you see the cartoon which shows you the resulting stimulus. It's very handy to understand what you are going to apply. The second part I am focusing is on defining the various segments both in their shape and the parameters, stimulus parameters, amplitude and duration. You can also define increments which will allow you to build up this type of stimulus. Last but as important as all the others is to def this is the link to the analysis so that the analysis knows where to extract the information to be able to apply analysis method and at the same time as the data are acquired to plot and show you the results of your experiment. So in this experiment we require a stimulus needs one test pulse repeated 25 times with a test amplitude ranging from minus 80 up to plus 40 increasing by 5 millivolts. So this is the resulting stimulus. We start at the holding, apply one test pulse to minus 80 and then increment that up to plus 40. So in the pulse generator we have defined these parameters 25 repeats in the number of sweeps. We start at minus 80 and increment by 5 millivolts these 25 times. And then we define the linked analysis. We define what analysis method we want to apply and we define that on the x-axis we are going to plot and use the segment amplitude of the second segment. Okay, so this is the segment which is increasing 25 times. Okay, that's the applied voltage for the testing. And we also use the second segment and measure in that segment during this voltage the current. Which, and we want to measure the peak current, meaning the maximum current or the minimum current, what, whichever is greater. So, if you apply this 25 traces with increasing amplitude, we get this figure 1 from the publication, 1A, that's the familiar uh, overview of the 25 recordings. Plotting the peak current against the voltage gives us this uh, plot out from the publication. And this is the goal we want to achieve in Patchmaster. So now we have to define in Patchmaster how to analyze this experiment. We do that in the online analysis window and we go there, define a named method so we can have different ones. We define in this experiment one graph which has one entry. On the X axis we plot the amplitude of the test pulse we apply. On the Y axis we compute and plot the extremum, minimum, meaning the maximum or minimum, whichever is greater. Down here we have the functions which give us the values which we are plotting. A function is a mathematical um, entity which res a applies a, an analysis method to a parameter and gives back one value. So for the amplitude it's rather simple. It gives us back the testing, test pulse amplitude. The function extremum takes the segment we, we, which we are defined and finds the extremum current in that segment. 
So with the, if we apply this analysis method, we have the resulting plot in the online window one. And we see here the peak current going in negative and coming back. So this is the IV, IV relation. Um, in the publication, they use normalized current. So to normalize, we need an additional parameter, which is the maximum current during this family of recordings. So we need a third function, which takes the extremum and can normalize it means it divides it by the maximum current. So we have in the plot we result, we plot not just the extremum but the normalized extremum. And this extremum is computed by using the result of this function here, which is the extremum current absolute, and divided by the maximum current which we in this experiment. Applying this method to our data will result in this plot and you see here that now it's not absolute peak current but it's normalized from 0 to minus 1. To find this peak maximum we have to reanalyze the data when it has been acquired. For that we use two protocols. Protocols allows us to define additional steps which are applied during the experiment. So we use one plot which defines the analysis method to apply and this para this protocol calls another protocol which goes through the family of uh, recordings and finds the maximum current. So you see here it comes in, starts at, with a mean of zero, goes through every single recording and finds out what is the biggest absolute value. In this case we are looking for the since the current is negative for the smallest current it's the, that current which has the biggest extent. Sort of odd but sodium currents are going negative. So this is the inactive okay sorry I have okay applying these two protocols you will see that this is the resulting thing. I can show you in real life, so that's Patchmaster, with the data from Kuming. I have here an, uh, an IV recording. This is, is composed of the 25 um, sweeps, each one measuring the current. So if I play it back, we see the resulting currents plotted in the oscilloscope and in the analysis window you see how the peak current increases to a maximum and then decreases. To get this normalization I have a pre, this predefined protocol which means that if I play this protocol goes through all the data, finds the maximum, divides every single plot and now we have the same plot as before but normalized for the peak current. Okay, now the same thing we, we apply, or the same approach we apply to this goal to measure steady state inactivation. The figure 1F from Kumin's paper has to be reproduced. So we analyze and say on the x-axis 
we have the increasing amplitude of an inactivating prepulse. The inactivation segment precedes F the fixed test pulse. Okay. On the y-axis we plot, in, in this plot, the inactivation time constant was plotted. So, summarizing, we apply different inactivation prepulses, we measure the peak current with a testing standard fixed size test pulse, we find the maximum peak current and we plot the fraction of available uh, peak current. So here we have the stimulus we want to apply. We apply a long pre-pulse of 500 milliseconds with increasing amplitude and then test after that with a short test pulse how much current of so, uh, uh, how much sodium current we still can see in the test pulse. Again, we, we go to the test pulse uh, editor, we define the 11 repeats we define the pre-inactivating uh, segment which starts at minus 130 millivolts, increases by 10 volts and lasts 500 milliseconds. That one is then followed by a fixed length 20 milliseconds test pulse which pulses to minus 10 millivolts to measure the remaining uh, peak current. Again, we make the connection to another analysis method, which is called this analysis, H-infinity. On x-axis, we plot the inactivation amplitude, and on which is the amplitude, the voltage we apply in this segment, and we plot against the current which we measure in the third segment. I just see that this should be a 2, not a 1. Sorry for that error. In the analysis again, we define a named analysis, so we can understand what we do. It has one graph, plots one entry, the amplitude of the inactivation segment against the normalized extremum. The result of this acquisition for applying this analysis method is the result is the inactivating, it's the plot of fraction peak current after the inactivation. We use the same approach, we use two protocols. One does the appropriate analysis, selects the appropriate analysis method, calls the second protocol which finds the maximum current, and then we apply the next analysis method which plots the normalized inactivation. So this is the next, the third experiment, which I'm going to jump over because it's just exactly the same. We define the experiment we, we need, meaning we look at the type of analysis we want, we define the stimulus we apply, this time we have a fixed length pre-challenging test, we wait for various times and measure the current which is um, available after this recovery period. In the protocol we do our definitions of the different parameters, we define the analysis. In the analysis we do exactly the same, define what parameter we want on X and what on Y. This will result 
in the normalized in the plot of fraction of peak current being recovered. For that we have done exactly the same. We have one protocol which takes over the transformation of the analysis. The next thing I want to ex explain is how to reduce the artifacts which occur during a typical sodium current measurement due to the capacitive transients and passive ohmic currents in your experiment. So traditionally it's called a P over 4 stimulus strain. So we have apply a voltage where no biological, biological current is evoked. For example at minus 120 millivolts. Then we apply four pulses, each one being a fourth of amplitude. And during this experiment, that's the reason we go to the voltage without biological response, only electrical artifacts should remain. So here a cartoon of what we do. This is our standard test pulse and it's repeated by the four sized down test pulses. Since capacitive and ohmic artef artifacts or whatever we call artifacts which means what we don't which is not from the biological origin, they are completely linear to the voltage we can compute how much we have to correct in the electrical response due to capacitive transients and ohmic currents. So in Patchmaster um, we support different sizing uh, P over N protocols for each output channel we allow to configure for each input channels. Okay. So looking back at the three experiments we just described, they all have been acquired using P over N leak subtraction procedure. The leak subtraction pr procedures are defined in the stimulus bar by going to we activate leak define how we want to store the leak and in the leak section we define how many leak pulses we want and what the sizing should be and at which voltage we want to do. So important is to store this average leak subtraction pulse. This allows us to look at the data with leak subtraction and without so we are able to see possible artifacts caused by uh, by correction pulses which are uh, for whatever reasons influenced by other factors like a door slamming, a motor, motor coming up or any other glitch. Okay, so again, store the average so you can see it with and weak leak subtraction. We store the leak subtractions themselves so you can inspect them and ensure that your data are appropriate and artifact free. And in the replay then you can see this leak if you want them and expect them to validate your data. You can see your leak pulses in the data as an additional trace in your recordings. You can activate subtraction of P over N leaks in the display menu by going there and activating subtract leak trace. You can activate uh, you can activate to subtract the leak traces and you can activate to show the leak traces in the oscilloscope. 
Here I show how an experiment looks with leak subtraction and without. The first one, this figure is a typical IV current measurement without leak subtraction correction. Here I have the corresponding leak traces, so the red traces are the traces measured at minus 120 millivolts, so they are without biological sodium current. And by subtracting this current to this, you get the result, that's the IV with P over N leak correction. And you see that it's very important because the sodium current is only a small fraction of the total current. The last thing I'm mentioning in my talk is how to do a zero subtraction. Zero subtraction is to subtract the leak current of the trace. Leak current is typically said whatever current is non-want. It's very crude, but typically it says the current in steady state is not the current which we are interested when we do apply a test pulse protocol. So typically, the most common choice is to use the current in the first segment. So, so in, we, the, uh, that's the reason that the first segment in most experiments are defined as holding. This allows us to define to this current in this segment by defining a zero segment as one, and the, we compute this leak current, store that, and if you want to subtract it, Patchmaster knows what value to subtract. This is in the display menu, you can activate subtracting zero offset. So what did we learn, hopefully? I try to bring up that it is a top-down approach. We start by defining the relationship w we want to study. From that we define the analysis graph we want to use. We define the stimulus template which we want to apply. Then we make the connection between the stimulus template and the analysis. Protocols then can be used to transform data to suit additional requirements. So the most important point for me is to say start out with the exact idea what you want to analyze. Many people think that starting like a student having a test, doing various test pulses and thinking about analysis after the experiment, they will end in patch master with thinking about um, a non-optimal, optimally defined environment. Okay, thanks a lot for your attention. Thank you Hubert. With that I'm going to switch present it to myself and we'll go into my talk. Okay, so basically my talk will continue and will we'll, uh, continue on some of the points that Hubert has mentioned. Uh, I will use also the online analysis, the protocol editor, and the PGF throughout to discuss uh, recording under the influence of uh, pharmacology of a sodium current. Uh, so my overview, I will discuss the solution handling, the solution database, some of you may know about it, some of you may not, uh, perfusion control, what aspects of Patchmaster you could use to control uh, different perfusion systems. Uh, we will go into a case study under the influence. Uh, one error from Jan's talk is the data set that I'm using is actually what was provided by Nanion and not from Dr. Cummings.
And finally, I will put automation in the protocol editor, similar to what Hubert did, uh, also using uh, the solution database and perfusion. So what is what we consider under the influence in these kind of experiments? So we have uh, electrophysiological experiments always use some kind of solution, and it's usually changed during the course of an experiment. Uh, we could keep track of these solutions. A lot of times people do it just manually by writing it into a lab notebook. Usually the preferred method is to do it electronically so it becomes part of the data file. Uh, Patchmaster does provide the tools to keep track of both the internal and external bath solutions. So we have a couple of different approaches to do this. One, which is the simplest approach, is just to use I internal and external solution numbers which are basically numbers that you keep in an external notebook. And here in Patchmaster, using the I.O. control window, you just tell it what number matches your notebook setting. Uh, this could be set from the I.O. control window, or if you're using the protocol editor, we have a command called set solutions, which allows you to do that as well. When you click on that, you now have the capability to set which solution you want to keep track of and what the number is. The more advanced approach is to actually create a solution database, and Patchmaster provides that for you. Here you have uh, a database which, ha which stores, uh, that gives you information about name and the ingredients, uh, and it gets stored along with the data set. Again, internal and external solutions values can be specified from the control window, I.O. control window. As you can see here, it's slightly different than the previous method. And also by using the set solution commands in the protocol editor. Now, either method, the important thing is that information is stored along with the parameters. Uh, one thing the Patchmaster does is that it stores tons and tons of parameters regarding your experiment. As you can see here, the parameter window, we have a number of different items for amplifier, trace, sweep, and so forth. And here under the trace items, we have the internal solution and the external solutions. So if we blow that up a little bit, and you see here, the, this data set was using use the solution database. So if we click on the show button, it actually brings up the solution database window to show us what our ingredients were. Now, to use the solution tracking, either method requires a few minor configurations to the program. So we need to go to the configuration window by going to the Windows pull-down menu and selecting configuration. There we go to the I.O. control tab and then we go and we select show solutions. Now, if we are using the database, then we have to go to the Configuration Files tab, which will allow us to specify, one, to enable the solution database by checking this item right here, which will then pop up a window to either create a new file, which will create a new database file. It creates it in memory, and it's ready to be edited. It's blank or to select an existing database file. When we do that, it pops up a standard file selector, and we select a, da a database file that already exists. Now, once we select a database file, that information gets added to the configuration. And once you store the configuration, then that database file will automatically be opened by Patchmaster. Now, to open the solution database, to edit it, we then go up to, again, to the windows, and we now have another setting here called solution base. And then we open up, again, the solution database sc edit screen. So here we have uh, basically what the screen looks like, and it allows us to specify an index, uh, basically a numerical value for this entry, and we have more entries available than anybody will ever use. And we could specify a name, we could have a numeric name and value, we could have a pH and what was used to do the pH adjustment. We could specify our ingredients, our cocktail in this case, uh, osmolarity. Then we have controls 
for actually handling the database, for allowing us to, here it shows the number of entries in our database file. We could create entries, we could duplicate, delete, and so forth. We have the capability to export labels and export a database listing. Uh, for example, if we want to export a label of this particular uh, solution, we would select export label. We could tell it where we want it to go. Do we want it to go as an ASCII file to a printer or to Igor or a notebook? And basically, you would get something that looks like this. In this case, it was printed. Same thing. If we want to get find out information about our entire database, we could do export listing. Again, we have choices of where the output is going to go. And here, I went to the notebook so we could see exactly here all the different uh, solutions that we have in this database. Now, to create a new entry, or simply we just go create entry. We enter, we give it a solution index, and here you would want to try to keep things consistent. You want to try to keep numbers uh, consistent for solutions that are similar, just for easier, just to easier to find. There is no predefined convention. That's up to you. And then we specify name, the value, pH, and so forth. And then finally, we actually go in and insert each of the ingredients by using uh, the commands here to either insert or append or to actually delete an ingredient from this. So once we have that, and here's what it would look like, we are ready to go. Now we have a solutions. Now we need, typically there's some kind of perfusion control that people use uh, to do this. So it could be uh, applied manually. Well, this is the brute force method. Uh, this is probably more to what you guys are used to. Or a lot of our customers are actually using perfusion systems. Now, most of this, tons of different systems available out there, and they each have their own way of being controlled. You could still do this manually by setting, uh, by setting switches on the different controller units, or you could do computer controlled. And PatchMask supports a variety of different computer controls for this. You could do it by using an analog voltage through using one of the D to A converters. You could do a waveform. You could create a, a waveform using the pulse generator. Or you could do just st standard TTL outputs, either as a single bit, single valve at a time, or a word which will combine multiple valve openings and closings at a time. It's PatchMaster supports all of these methods. Again, the basic set control is through the I.O. control window. Here you have the digital outputs that you could uh, enable on and off. And this is a static control. It turns it on and off manually. Same with voltage by using an available D to A channel, depending on which amplifier you're using, which interface. The number of available D to A channels will vary. Or you could do it as part of the pulse generator. And typically, this is where you have the most uh, power. This is where things are uh, synchronized together. Again, you have, uh, as Hubert showed in his pulse generator, you have the stimulus pulse that could be on channel number one. And then you could have a different output channel, in this case, channel number two, which will define our template for controlling this perfusion system. Uh, as you can see, again, you could have a digital word, a TTL or a DA voltage to control this. So you could do arbitrary waveform for this output channel, and you could have separate timing. So here you could specify that the timing in terms of each one of these segments is different than the main stimulus pulse, but it's still synchronized. Now we go into our case study. So Jan uh, briefly talked about this. We're going into NAV 1.7. Uh, with increasing concentrations of tetracaine. This data set was provided by Nanion. Actually, it was acquired use of their patch liner system. So again, as uh, Hubert mentioned, you need to have a stimulation pulse, something that will be, could be used in, based on the data set that was provided by Nanion. This is uh, what we derived from it. So we started off with a minus 75 millivolt holding potential for 10 milliseconds. Then we went into our test segment, our inactivating segment, to 0 millivolts, 20 milliseconds. Then we go into a two-second recovery from inactivation. 
And finally, we're going into a longer waiting period, a hold, again, at holding a minus 75. This is what it would look like in the pulse generator. Uh, again, you have here an interval, sweep interval of 10 seconds. The number of sweeps here was 1,000. This is more than we'll actually use. Uh, but as we go through the protocol, we'll, at, we'll go through one sweep at a time, and then we could stop uh, any time. And again, we use uh, our segment classes to define our pulses, both in time and in voltage. Uh, one thing that's different than what Hubert showed was I am actually using a segment here that is actually not stored. It is not saved with the data set and also not displayed. And P over, over, P over 4 leak subtraction was also enabled, as Hubert mentioned, and here are the parameters for it right here. Okay, so in this data set, they were acquired uh, actually 88 different sweeps before they stopped it, and they started with a control, then concentrations of tetracaine, uh, 1 micromolar, 10, 100, 1 milli, and then back to control. So part of this that you want to do is to have an analysis running with the acquisition and again as Hubert mentioned we have a tie into the online analysis and we are again we are using analysis functions and graphs to define what analysis what online analysis we want to graph so here we are I'm using uh, computing the current peak we are using the series time to give us a time course and here is where we put the graph entry together, series time over the peak. And as Hubert mentioned, the save this as an analysis method, which ties back to our pulse generator. This is what, uh, once you run through this data set, this is what the time course would look like. Uh, we can now modify that a little bit so we get a little better graph by using the modify axes uh, control here. And this allows us not to fine-tune some, some units in terms of the ticks, uh, what kind of values we would like on the grid, and so forth. Once we do that, you see here we've now just improved it a little bit. We get a little bit more information on both the X and Y uh, graph. Now, as Hubert did in his presentation, he used the protocol editor to do the automation. Uh, basically, we are doing the same thing here, and we're using math functions, and we're using all the different looping available within the program to do this. So we want to perform an acquisition where we are changing the bath solution to all the different concentrations. We are going to do a loop where we first open up a perfusion valve. We are going to set the external solution from the database. We then go into an acquisition loop, which will acquire a sweep, perform and running average. After the sixth sweep has been acquired, we're going to compare for steady state. We're going to then, once we have steady state, we'll stop acquisition, we'll reset and go back to our next perfusion. So we do this by using a set of global variables that are available in Patchmaster. And in the configuration, in the I.O. control window, you can specify how many different values are available to you, as well as also renaming these values. And now when you do that, in the I.O. control window, you will now see these values with the names that you specified, and they will be updated as, you, as your protocol executes. No, another tool that I use that Hubert used as well is this chain protocol command. So this allows us to modularize, to break down the execution of the protocols into various components. So the first protocol I called, which I use in a couple of different uh, areas, is to initialize all of the values that I defined to zero. And I use these for counters and for, and for doing the mathematics in, in my averaging. Then I wrote a protocol that does the perfusion control. And here, I basically, again, I check a counter, and then based on that, I specify the digital control and, and the change the solution database to match what, uh, what concentration I'm currently using. So as I said, the counter state is used to uh, set the digital using, this is a simple digital control by setting a digital valve on and off. 
Uh, by the way, all of these protocols and the data set are available for download, so you could actually try them and modify them as you like. The next protocol will actually perform the averaging. Uh, so this performs a running average by. So we are looking at five suites. We're acquiring a sweep. We are calculating the peak current. Then we are going down to the next sweep and doing so. So we're doing that for five sweeps. We are computing an average. And then we compare it to the next sweep. Then we here we specify that if the average is above, and here's a, a small error, it should be 0.5%. We then stop and consider the steady state, and then we go on to the next part. So we put this whole thing together in the protocol I call NA test, and here's what, how it looks like. So first, I clear the oscilloscope, the online window, and reset the timers. I then create a new program group in the data file. Then we set the internal solution and set the perfusion valve. We initialize the values. We then call our perfusion control. And then here we acquire, we go into a repeat loop acquiring single sweep at a time. And then we do the averaging and then we check for steady state and then repeat the process until we're completed. So now I'm going to switch over to Patchmaster to show um, actually not actually running in terms of uh, real live acquisition but this is the data set that was created and I, we, I modified the, the protocol file to actually go through the data file to do the online analysis and, the, and, uh, um, and plotting instead of actually going out and doing the acquisition. So here I would run it by clicking on file test and here as you can see it's going through it's reading each data set each sweep from our file it's creating the time course and here's our concentration graph and you can see it's going through it's showing on the protocol editor here all the steps that it's that it's running and then the graphs are going on until all the data set is completed so this is how it would look in patchmaster again this is a protocol using the data file instead of actually acquisition And with that, uh, summarize, so Patchmaster, as shown by both Hubert and myself, offer a variety of tools for, uh, for a variety setting up and controlling experiments. So you could do uh, tracking of solutions, you control external devices, you could automate uh, external procedures uh, any way you like. The protocol editor, combination of the protocol editor, the online analysis, and the PGF allow quite a bit of functionality and uh, flexibility in this. With that, I'd like to thank you for, for attending, and I would like to open this up uh, for a few minutes for some questions. So thank you, Tally, Jan, and Hubert for giving your talks. <clears throat> As we are already running out of time, actually we are already 30 minutes ahead, so I allow only a few questions. But please keep on asking questions, so later on we will respond, we will answer them via email, and we will also populate them on our website, as Telly has already mentioned. So a question for Hubert. What is the easiest way to make a quick report? Is by, is by doing a copy and paste. Can you be uh, a bit more specific? What do you mean with copy and paste? <laughs> May I show? Yes, I'll um, change. Yeah, I will that's change a big you true. right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, Hubert, you are now presenting. Okay, thanks. Um, most people are aware of copy and paste, but they are not aware that you can use it in Patchmaster as well. So I start now with a Microsoft win Word window. So you can write here, um, this, just my report, then you go here and you say, okay, I, this is um, my analysis, which I want to show my, for example, PhD advisor. You go here and you say copy. 
then you go into your word and you go here and you say paste okay okay now you have your result already in in word um, and from here on you can proceed it like any notebook you want uh, if you can even go and change fonts and and graphics so the quickest way to do is copy and paste from Patchmaster into any standard word processor. Okay, thank you. This is really rather comfortable. Okay, a question. Um, this is not really addressed to a specific talker to one of you. I, I propose a pick tally. So tally, where can I download the protocols and the data that you used? Oh, so everything is available on our event page at hacker.com. Uh, we have there all of the uh, uh, past presentations, our past webinars, and including all of the data sets and actually a PDF version of all of our talks. Uh, if anybody does need any of the slides uh, for teaching purposes, we'll be more than happy to share those as well. Okay, thank you. Last question to Telly, then we're going to finish the session. Um, sorry, to Hubert. So, Hubert, how many exper experiments can be prearranged? In Patchmaster, you can define as many protocols, as many stimuli, as many analysis as you want. Um, you have seen that they can have names, so you can have dozens prepackaged. So, Building up a library uh, is the most efficient way to make the experiment experience then reliable and uh, quick. Okay. Thank you. With that, I return the mic to Telly. Thank you, Lars. Okay, I have one more comment that I, I should have mentioned in my talk, and I will switch uh, to just show briefly. And... Uh, in Patchmaster, uh, one thing that w we didn't really touch on, but I wanted to show people is the in the online analysis. Uh, sorry, here, uh, I don't know. we if you go to the analysis functions, we have now uh, added a lot of uh, equations and math capabilities, and this is what we did throughout. Uh, Hubert used it, and I used it to to do all the various parts, uh, as well as doing it in the protocol editor. So this is now a new powerful feature uh, that allows you to basically define anything you would like. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for attending. I'd like to thank the presenters for, for presenting your talks. Uh, if there's any other additional questions, we will definitely answer them by email. Uh, and then we will also post them on our website with all of this material. And with that, I will stop this webinar. Thank you all for attending.